made you decide to collect these artifacts from the church? Beats me. <laughs> the day of the... I had a few artifacts before. And then the day of the sale when they sold the belongings to the church in 92, Driving in that morning, I was wondering, gee, I mean, you know, after the sale today, who knows where everything's going to be at. So I, I don't know, I got a bug and when I came home that evening, I was wondering what I, where I was going to display it. So it was one of them, you know, I, I had collected a few things, but, uh, not to speak of until that day. I mean, and then, see, now there's the, the cemetery gate. We got married by this altar. That's the baptismal font right there that all of our children got baptized. Uh, these are some of the pews that were in the church when they remodeled it back in 49. So they, it's not the original, but they, you know, that, that's when they remodeled it and expanded it. So then, these are some of those pews. That is one of the stained glass windows. That's in the was in the church. Uh, the chairs belong to the, the come from the church in there. Uh, some of the candles on here are from. St. Andrew's, the way it, <clears throat> it, the last time it was held and uh, services were held in the spring of 92. Uh, we've got uh, an old family catechism or Bible laying here from the Myers, which records the birth and the death of most of my uncles and aunts and uh, the Meyer relation. Um, we, we don't have your wife here, so how did you meet her? Well, let's see how that was. She always says it was like this. I drove to high school, mm -hmm. drove with a vehicle. So they didn't have a way to get uh, into school. So her dad asked my dad if I could pick them up, you know, when they come by and take them in. So on occasion, I mean, I took them all in. When they went by, it stopped by and took and brought them in. And I don't know, over the years, you know what happens. <laughs> now what, as you were in your youth, what would you do for a date? What would your friends do for a date? Where'd you go? Well, at that time, we had uh, movies at Zealand, Saturday nights, Sunday nights. And old Pete Hosmiller, he always sold popcorn in front of the city hall. So you go to uh, the movie, have a nickel bag of popcorn, and that kind of took care of it. Movies, I think, were maybe 25 cents. Did you have a favorite movie or favorite actor or actress? Not really, not really. Uh, <clears throat> I still have a poster of one of the sealant 
movies when they advertised it over in the idea of a house. Uh, oh, I've got some other paraphernalia, you know, from other things. But like I say, I <coughs> collect a little bit of everything and not too much of anything. So it, uh, I can give you a brief description of basically, I think everything that's in here, if, if you're looking at it, if you want a, any information on it. <clears throat> Let's hear more about your wedding, though. Well, we got married, I suppose, on one of the coldest days of the year. It didn't turn out to be that cold in the morning, but <clears throat> January the 28th, by the time the evening rolled around, it got down to 30 below or better. So <clears throat> it was a, a cool day. We went uh, to have our wedding picture taken. We went down to Eureka, to Heilman's. He was a photographer. We were drove down there, we had a picture taken. And on the way back, yeah, it was starting to drift already. Of course, that evening it got a little colder yet. And at that time, uh, you know, the wedding should start in the afternoon already and uh, go a little later in the evening. Yeah, it was one of those that, I suppose, a typical wedding. At that time, they were on a Monday. And nowadays, they're usually on a weekend. Yeah. <clears throat> and why? They were on a, generally on a Monday. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no idea. I mean, you know, why that was the case. So you got married on a Monday. It was yep. afternoon is when the ceremony was, or would you have gotten married in the morning? Uh, I believe we did right after dinner, I think. I mean, most of the time the weddings were at uh, in the morning. But... Uh, I believe, uh, I think, yeah, I forgot about it, but I think we were early in the afternoon. And then we went, drove down to Eureka to have pictures taken, and of course the rest of the wedding, they were whatever. In fact, they even, I think, did a little bit of dancing in the afternoon already. <clears throat> but you wouldn't have been there, you guys were still driving. I, you guys were still driving around while they were dancing in the yeah, afternoon? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> because we went down to Eureka and had photographs taken, and then we came back <clears throat> and joined the rest of the party, the wedding going on. Did you guys take a honeymoon? Well, not really, not until years afterwards, <laughs> maybe 35 years later. <laughs> well, I had a Make sure that what it lasts before you take a wedding, uh, honeymoon. Well, being the church, when you would have come to church as a as a child, <clears throat> would the altar have been right here like this, or how? Uh, no. When I was a child, uh, this part was bumped way against, and the priest at mass. And he was phasing that way. It was later on, and uh, oh, I don't know, I suppose the early 60s, that uh, it was changed that he celebrates Mass facing the people. <clears throat> so uh, this altar got split. And I believe John Solway, I think, was the one that had the job of splitting it, putting a front section and a back section to it. And uh, of course, some of them, they just had a plain little altar up front, you know, uh, a table. Each, there were really no guidelines. And I suppose it depended on the make of the altar. I mean, I think they decided that this one wasn't that hard to split. And so that's what happened, and they split that. And when you came to Mass on a Sunday, would you would you just come to Mass? Would that be the only thing, come for Mass for about an hour or two hours and leave? Uh, 
In the younger days, they always had benediction yet after Mass. So that stretched it out somewhat. Uh, nowadays, you know, benediction is something that's, uh, you know, by itself separate. So things have changed in the Mass, too. I mean, everything has gone English nowadays. What was Christmas like for your family? Would you come to Mass? Oh, yes. We'd come in there. That was, you know, usually at 11.30, midnight. And that was a fairly long ordeal, at least when you were younger, it seemed like it was pretty long. I don't know, just maybe it was only an hour and a half. I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it seemed like, you know, it was at night and you got tired and it seemed like it was pretty long. I do have the original nativity set that was in uh, St. Andrews, right in the back here, too, set up. Oh, do you? Okay. Yes. Well, we'll take a look at that in a minute. Okay. So after Mass, would you, after Midnight Mass, did you go home and open yes. presents? Or had you already opened presents? No, we generally opened it before, okay. after supper. Okay. That was the time when we'd open Mass and have some Christmas goodies and then look at the clock and huh, it's about that time. And uh, early on it was always, first started at midnight, later on and then uh, it started at 11.30 and start singing sometimes at 11 o'clock. So mm -hmm. over time, you know, some of those things have changed too. What would be examples of Christmas presents you would have gotten as a child? Well, they weren't as elaborate as they are nowadays. <laughs> if I got a toy tractor, you know, I got one. And that was maybe the extent of it, you know, from my parents. So. Usually just one present. Yes. Did you have St. Nicholas coming around, Santa Claus? No, that was never really in, in my family. It was never really the case. Now, after we were married and our kids grew up, then, you know, we had Santa Claus come around. Okay. Yeah. And what about for Easter? Well, how would your family celebrate Easter? Well, they're basically, I think it was kind of celebrated the way it is even nowadays. I mean, you know, we'd go, to, the only thing is, you know, now most of the time, you know, we'll go to church Saturday evenings, and uh, at that time, you know, you know, we'd go on Sunday, but now, I mean, you know, with three parishes, it usually is split up. Mm -hmm. So if you got Saturday evening uh, service, you don't have them on Sunday because, you know, we've got three, three parishes here. So that's something that's changed just because of the fact that, you know, a priest here has three parishes to take care of. If it wouldn't be for that, you know, I suppose it would still be basically what it was when we were kids. There's but um, Was there only one Mass on Sundays? Or would there have been more than one when you were a kid? We went out at St. John's and they had one Mass on Sunday. Okay. That was it. At Zealand at St. Andrews, they always had two. Because even after they enlarged the church, it was still not quite big enough to accommodate all the people in one mass. Oh, okay. And as time went on, I don't know where all the people went to. Either they moved away or they just moved a mile and a half. <laughs> 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 anyway, there, there was yeah. a split there. I mean, some moved to a, moved on to different places and others, you know, they died and they, they moved about a mile and a half to the local cemetery. So for Easter, would you go to Mass on Thursday or Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday? We generally went on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay. Would you find Easter eggs? Do any kind of... No. Okay. No, no. That is something that we never did. No, I mean, this Easter, I think we had, what, over 200 eggs out on the lawn up there. So the grandkids had all, 
kind of a good time. In fact, after they were all done, the granddaughter from down here, Tiffany, they were saying, you know, where there were some aches hidden and she was observant and listened to it and all and she came back and she said, I found two more. <laughs> she listened to where the, the older ones had stashed them and she went back and she checked and she came back with two more. She explained them. Yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead and explain the various items in here that are uh, important to you. That well, like I say, I think about ninety percent of the material in here is from St. Andrews. Mm -hmm. A few items are from St. John's. Uh, the Stations of the Cross, they are not from St. Andrews or St. John's, but they are in the same style as both St. Andrews and St. John's had. Originally, these were at the church over at Lamore. When they built a new church, uh, they were brought to Eureka, South Dakota, and they had that when they started a church there in the southern part of the town. And uh, they were in there. And then when they decided to build a new church, a uh, private individual wound up, he bought the church with some of the belongings, and that's when I acquired them, you know, from him. Uh, the pump organ in the back does not come from the church. It's close to the one that was in St. Andrews. Uh, I picked that up at Mount City at an auction. Years ago, they always said they had a religious corner in uh, the homes. That little altar sitting on top of the organ there, mm -hmm. that was the one that was on my parents' corner. Oh. It was, uh, some of the pieces were broke and uh, some missing. And uh, I got to an auction sale where there was one sold that had been pieced together too, some parts of it. And so I bought that one, and out of the two, I put a complete unit together. We've got uh, song books that Father Victor Schill put together, and uh, I'd venture to say we've got more song books than anybody else in our collection. And I don't know just how many we do have. We've got some other artifacts there. Oh, in case we ever run into it where somebody wants to get married here, we've got a bride's dress back in the vestibule there yeah. with the veil. And if they bring a cake, we also got a cake top. Is the bride, is that wedding dress anybody's in particular, or just what you picked up? It's one we picked up, but we know where it went to, or where it belonged to. It's a 56 model. It's a Meidinger from over at Ashley. I'd have the name on the back on, okay. on it. I mean, you know, the one that, that wore it. And evidently, that woman didn't care too much about it. I mean, you know, for me, I wouldn't have gave up, you know, something like that, no matter what. Yeah. And I saw the ad in the paper called her up, and she said, well, I don't know, I think I should have $5 for the dress and the veil. I said, okay, I said, I don't know. I won't be there for the garage sale, but uh, I'll either have somebody come there and pick it up, or I'll be there the day afterward. So the day after, I still didn't make it, but one of our daughters went there and picked it up, and then she got the cake top with it. Nice. Five dollars. <laughs> well, that was one of those things that, uh, I mean, you know, to me, what, I still have my wedding suit. You know, at that time we didn't have tux. Mm -hmm. And Florence still has her wedding dress. Of course, she might not fit into it. <laughs> we'll um, we've got 
an old stove back there. That's the kind that they used a lot of times in a church like this, in a smaller church. Because somebody had to come to church early to get it going to be yep. warm at the time. Even then, it maybe wasn't too warm. And there's a Chinese holy picture on top. Uh, <clears throat> there's two of them like that in North Dakota. We have one, and the church at Ashley has the other one on display. Uh, Fred Merrick knew a missionary over in China, and uh, he got a hold of the, the two copies. He donated one to the church at Ashley. I was a good friend of his. I don't know. Donated so the other one to you. He, so <laughs> I wound up with the other one. So uh, let's. Yeah. The lights, these are the original lights for the, this church here when it was used as a church. The church in Zealand at St. Andrews had exactly the same kind, mm -hmm. different, same ones. When we cleaned it up in 92, I didn't know how to get the shade off because it's a different mechanism. Yeah. So I've got a brother-in-law, he's an electrician. So when he came here once, and I said, he's supposed to come out here. I said, now you look at that and you tell me how to take that off. So he was standing on the stepladder and looking at it. And he, oh, he said, oh, he says, I know how this goes. And he turned that up there, and it must have let loose a little quicker. And that globe just hit the floor, and it, I mean, a thousand pieces. Everywhere. Yep. And uh, now and then I was going to replace it. And I called the antique shops. I just can't find anything. Mm -hmm. Finally, I thought, wait a minute. You know, when we had a sale in 92, uh, they would, we had the same kind. Mm -hmm. And the gal went and she bought two of them first. And then nobody bit really on the, on the rest, so she got the others too. And so I knew that she only really wanted two of them. And the others, well, okay, the price was right. Mm -hmm. So but I didn't know who it was. So I called Herman, the auctioneer. Oh, yeah, he says, that was Susan. And she happened to go to our church at that time. So I picked up the phone that Sunday and called out, and I got her. And he says, well, she isn't at home right now, but she'll be home in a few minutes. And I asked him about that. And he says, yeah, she donated two of them to the church where she was at because she wanted, you know, mm -hmm. for that church. And he sold, she sold one, somebody, but he's, she still got some. Okay. So, I mean, half hour later or so, the phone rings and here she comes. I told her what I called her for. Yeah, she says, I'll sell it to you. And I asked her what she wanted and she didn't hold me up. I mean, she basically wanted what she had paid for. So. There's no argument there. And then she says, oh, I'll bring it to church next Sunday. So I didn't even have to drive after it. And I put it in here, and I mean, I, re I know which one went and which one was broke, but there is no distinguish between the four. No, They're, they look exactly the same. They are exactly the same. And I mean, uh, once you look at some of that stuff, in that late 40s, early 50s era, all the churches that were worked on, they all had the same lights, no matter what religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were basically those lights, and I've seen them in other churches, and I, yep, they were the ones that were redecorated or built late 40s, early 50s. Wow. And it's something that tells you. Just like the Stations of the Cross, they'll kind of tell you what era, you know, they come from. How so? so? How can you tell on these, actually, how old are these ones again, the Station of the Cross? Are they they're, right? Yeah, they're over 100 years old. They are anywhere from the late uh, 1800s, you know, 1895 to 2005, that 10 year period is where that style fit in. 
So there are things that you can tell, you know, by by that. And I, I'm not an expert at it, but some you ask somebody else. I mean, if you're interested in something like that, and all that you meet an individual, he can fill in, you know, something. Mm -hmm. I have often said I've gone to a lot of meetings in my lifetime. I have always come home with a new idea at every meeting. I have never, can't say that, I always came home with what I wanted, that I thought I'd get out of that meeting, but I always picked up something. Even to this day, I mean, if I go someplace, I'll catch something that, yeah, I didn't know. With the Stations of the Cross, would you have said the Stations a lot as a child? Or in church, in church, we'd, we'd do that. Was it a weekly basis or only? No, no. Basically, uh, turned to Easter season. Would they be said on Sunday then as well, or during the Easter season? Or would no, usually it was on a separate day during the Easter season. And your family would come on in to? Yes. The whole parish. The whole parish would? would would come in on a certain certain day. When you guys came in to sit down at church, was there a certain seating arrangement where you guys sat? At that time? Yes, there was. The young boy sat over on the on this side over here mm -hmm. in the front. The girl sat on the front this side. Mm -hmm. The women sat further back. The men sat over on this side further back. That was the custom. Oh, I suppose 50 years ago, I know it finally broke, up to about 50 years. And it was not only the custom in the Catholic Church in this area, it was the custom of every religion you can talk to. Any of the religions, you know, that the older ones that were around, and that was the same custom. Okay. Yeah. So. Did you have problems with the kids up front sitting by their friends, not paying attention? Yes. Yeah. But I mean, there was some other thing that was all. But you could always slough off of quite a few of the kids to the women, the younger ones. Oh. The men sat over on the other side clear. <laughs> so I think it took a while for the women to catch on. <laughs> <laughs> so we see a lot more kids over here than over there. Yeah. So I mean, finally, yeah, I mean, you know, it, you know, that changed. Uh, you know, they started sitting together, and and the kids were sitting with the family too. So you wouldn't worry about little Susie and little Jane chit chatting up here anymore. Well, if that's all they did, that wouldn't have been so bad. But sometimes they kind of got a little more out of hand. What would be an example of what kids, how kids would have behaved if they were oh, I mean, up in church? If there was some certain kid up front, the bench in front of you, I mean, and they thought they were going to make it interesting for that kid, they did, you did. You'd poke at him? Or? Yeah, all kinds of stuff. And I missed out on a lot of that because I was an altar server up here. So I could see it, but I couldn't, I wasn't in on it. <laughs> That's just like, you know, when a benediction, you know, and they had the, you know, the incense. Of course, it didn't take too long to figure out that if you pulled the chain up a little bit, you could give the charcoal a little more air, and you could get the more you swung, the more you could get it into the church all over. So I mean, you. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is what we'd always get the the job of lighting the charcoal. Mm -hmm. Well, we, it didn't take too long to figure out that if you went back in the sacristy and lit it just a little bit before, you didn't really get it white, and then it wouldn't smoke as good. So we just always snuck out a little earlier. One of us went in the back of the sacristy and lit it. So by the time benediction started, that little charcoal brick was white. And then when you drop that incense on, you know, it it made it. Did the priest ever say anything? No. <laughs> he maybe liked it. So. Did you want to become an altar server, or did your parents kind of make you, encourage you? I think they maybe, maybe encouraged me a little bit, I mean, and, and I suppose maybe, 
you know, that one of the priests, I mean, I kind of talked to, you know, if I wouldn't want to do that. And that was one of them things that me and another individual wound up, you know, being in on it. And I had that job way into my high school years. So that was one of them things. I mean, you know, you just knew it. Mm -hmm. You know, you. And if one of us was missing, there was only two of us at that time, you know, for years. When I started, there was a number of them, but I don't know why I, the priest that was on, you know, at that time, they didn't inquire about, you know, getting new ones. Mm -hmm. You know, they had two of us, and that's good enough. So, some of that stuff, I mean, you know, you don't get out of it until you walk out of it, because they don't look for a replacement. Mm -hmm. And you must not have done anything too bad then. <laughs> oh, well, it, <laughs> it was another one of life's experiences, which I'm glad. I, I've done it. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. well, my wife put down a list of some of the organizations and some of the accomplishments that I've done in my lifetime. And I says, well, page is full. Let's quit. <laughs> Been busy. And well, yes. So now, any... Is there anything else you'd like to talk about to tell us the date of the stuff? Okay, the flags, both the, the flag on the, the right side, you know, it's the official flag of the church, and that's the flag of the, our country. Were those have been in the church? Huh? Were those in the church? Yes. When you were a child, they would have had both flags in there? Yes. Oh. Basically, even to this day, the only place in the Catholic Church that you don't have them inside is the Diocese of uh, Fargo. You that's go why I asked, because there's not there. You go to... <laughs> down to South Dakota, you go to the Bismarck Diocese, you see him in there. Mm. So somewhere along the line, our bishop decided, no. Okay. So, I mean, but before that, they were always situated okay. in the church. Okay. And that's why when you leave uh, this diocese and go to lots of the other dioceses in the country, you still find them in there, both of them. It's just like in this diocese right now, the children get confirmed before they have First Holy Communion, mm -hmm. which is a rarity in the United States. I don't think there's more than about 10 dioceses in the United States that have that. Oh, wow. Oh. So right now, if, if there's any questions about anything, I'll... Wondering about, I'm just looking around, taking everything in too. Are there any other stories you have about church and religion that you'd like to share? Well, most of it is basically, I suppose it's kind of tradition. Now, the three plaques back there, uh, setting up on the altar, they're the plaques that when the Mass was held in Latin and they were laying on the altar. And so, I mean, it was a, you know, that when the priest was moving, and they were laying flat, so you didn't really, you didn't see them from the back. And that's what they read off, part of it, oh. you know, the Latin mass. And uh, I have, you know, like I say, over the years, you acquire things. And uh, like the cross that was in the middle of the altar, that I acquired, and that's the original cross that was in that altar over all the years. I mean, that's over 100 years old, too. Wow. You, it was replaced, mm -hmm. and uh, I wound up acquiring it. Now, did you understand the Mass in Latin, or did you just know what you were supposed to say back? You knew it by heart, but you didn't know what you were saying. <laughs> It's supposed to be a universal language, but to us peons, to the <laughs> altar service, it was no idea. Latin, or you could put another word and say it was Greek. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, is there anything else you'd 
anything back around behind that you'd like to show? I'm not sure what all's back there. Oh, on the back side? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Done. Just to light up the, the nativity scene. Now, this is the original one from St. Andrews. That is over 100 years old now. And it has had minimal work to it. It's over 100 years we, old. Uh, when St. Andrews replaced it, me and Donnie saw why were the two that were interested in it. And so Father Mental thought, well, the reason how to do that is told us both to come in. He says, I suppose it's like this. Whoever pays the most gets it. So, of course, you know, I started, I don't know what I said. Donnie said this, and we were going, and finally I quit. Because Donnie was a tough bidder. <laughs> I mean, whenever he wanted something, he always got it. Oh. So, okay, he got it. And uh, after, you know, he had that. And then he set it up outside for nativity. And then one, one winter, it got vandalized. And uh, finally, they all did come back, but some of them were kind of chipped and stuff like that. And then him and his wife split later on. And then his wife called me and she says, uh, if I would be still interested in that, because she knew I mm -hmm. was after it. I said, yeah. So uh, I negotiated with her and I wound up getting it at that time. And then my wife retouched the set. I mean, you know, the ones that were chipped, she mm -hmm. touched them up and finished them, you know, that look presentable again. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, you know, years ago they used to have uh, Christmas trees, uh, candles, and they'd burn them. Well, we've got the original you know, holders with candles on there. So now you can see, I mean, if you'd light them, why there were so many fires. I was going to say, did you ever set any Christmas trees on fire? No, I didn't because I've never lit any. Okay. But I, well, no, I when mean, you were a child, when you but, were a kid. Uh, when years ago, before electricity, some of them, I mean, and uh, to, you know how, uh, you know, how fast they'll burn. They're just like gasoline. I mean, they catch, I mean, so, I mean, they finally decided that just a little dangerous. So, I've got the candles there, but I don't think there's any matches in here to light them with. Probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, that statue there comes from St. John's. Mm -hmm. That my mother wound up, when they kind of remodeled it, she, she wound up with it. And she's the one that painted it, and I've left it. I mean, it's not it that decent, that now. decent a paint job. But that comes from St. John's. If you look at the St. John's picture of the altar, mm -hmm. you'll see those angels by the altar too. So that is one of the angels on the altar in St. John's too. Uh -huh. And. Uh, now, let's see, that cross up there, this altar was a little too high for the building here. So I just bumped it up against the ceiling, mm -hmm. took off the cross, and put it back here. Mm -hmm. So any time a person would want to, you know, that's the cross, the original cross that was on top of this altar. Okay. Uh, and there's a... One of the incense burners back here someplace. Yeah, if it's hanging down below the... Okay, there's someplace there. Oops, hang on, there's also the water sprinkler. Oh, okay, that's, that's up there. The uh, that, that came from St. John's. You know, and I as an altar server always uh, thought for myself, you know, on Good Friday we used them. And I thought, you know, if you could hit them hard enough, you could break off the hammer. Never <laughs> did get it done. <laughs> Why... <laughs> They're at St. John's, but when would you? On Good Friday, because they didn't use no belts. Belts were silent on Good Friday. Okay. So you used that, you went around outside first to tell the 
Was Customers, that, it's time it, to come to church. Oh, okay. And then you used it during the church service uh, during that day, too, inside. But like I say, when I walked around, ran around the cars, you know, to tell them it's time to get into church, mm -hmm. conversation's over with. Uh, I thought one of these days I'd walk in with two pieces, but I never did. <laughs> never broke it. Nope, never <laughs> did. So they must be pretty good shape. Yeah. Uh, that's a fourth degree Knights of Columbus cape, all right, that uh, a friend of mine got a new one, donated it, and uh, I've got several Last Supper pictures hanging on the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought it maybe be more appropriate back here than in the middle of the church different styles and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I th think that's about the extent of it in here. We've got the... What about the, the bust of Jesus here? Where is this from? Uh, that belonged to my grandfather. My okay. Grandpa Meyer. He had it in his home. My mother had it up to the time when I set this up in 92, and at that time she gave it to me, you know, and then I put it in here. Okay. Same thing with these other two over here, the statues. You know, she had them, and I wound up in 92 after I had this set up to mm -hmm. do that. Okay. Uh, there's a, in 1913. We can get a shot. Uh, well, that's not from the, that one's not from the church. Which, this cross? Is, or is it? Oh, yes. Oh. In 1913, they had a, a mission fest in both St. John's and St. Andrew's. This is the one from St. Andrew's. And that was displayed in the church at St. Andrew's up until 92 when the church was sold. St. John's, I don't know where they had it, but later on, when the church was abandoned, the cross was laying in church. But where it was stored, I don't know. But it was, the date was on in 1913. So whenever that mission was held in 1913, both mm -hmm. places had that. So. Well, and now did you say you also, uh, the, the farmhouse from the 1920s that's nearby as well? About a mile away from here. We just even go, we don't go outside, but you just take pictures of the outside, see what it's like, see where you can tell a little bit about the layout there, so. Okay. And then can you just tell me about this house? Well, it? this is, we're right now, we're on the original homestead of my grandpa Englehart. He homesteaded this place in 1900. And uh, in about 19... 22, they decided, you know, it's time that they put up a new home. And so at that time, they put up this home. And uh, so my dad was born on this farmstead. I was born on this farmstead. I was born in the basement of this home. There's a little room to the south end. That was the place where I... I was born. Did a lot of farmhouses have basements? Basically, they all did. Okay. Basically, they all did. Uh, but in the 1920s, most of them fixed up the basements for living space. In the early 1900s, most of them, they had basements, but they weren't uh, fixed up for a living area. So that was one of the customs that, that did change. Early 1900s, they'd build a home, or late 1800s, and they generally had what you call a summer kitchen, which is where they did their baking in serving the meals during the summer months. You know, maybe 50 feet away from the home, main home. So as times changed, you know, so did the you know, and they had styles those years, just like they do now. Yeah, this is where you would have spent a lot of time.
Hi, Matt. Since it is only about a mile from yes. your farm. Yes. Yeah. And then, you know, after my grandparents retired, you know, my uncle lived up here. And then, you know, uh, my dad and him had, you know, a few pieces of equipment together. So uh, we got up to this yard more than any other yard besides our own. And then, uh, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, my aunt decided to sell this, this place. And then our son, Jim, wound up acquiring it, you know, at that time. So it's been in the Engelhardt family name for or over a hundred years. In fact, it's been in the, for 106 years now. Do you have a, a special or a favorite memory that happened in this house? Mm, not really. I mean, we never really, as long as my grandparents lived here, the kitchen area was basically downstairs. So we were always downstairs. When my uncle, you know, wound up being taken, uh, moving in, and then he put in cupboards and stuff and put the kitchen in upstairs. There was a kitchen upstairs, but it wasn't used. Just like the dining room and the living room. It was all there, but basically it wasn't used. The only thing that was used on the first floor was the bedroom. That's where the parents slept. Basically, all the children slept in the bedrooms upstairs. The upstairs has got one bathroom, none on the main floor. Do you know why they didn't use the first floor? I think it was more of a showcase, I think. I think that's what, what the case was. Because all the homes that were built in those years, they had a full finished basement underneath, and that's where the people lived. I mean, they, that midsection just, you know, the parents used to sleep in that, that mid, mid floor, the main floor. But uh, children slept on the top floor. And like this place, it's got uh, one, two, three, four, uh, maybe five bedrooms upstairs. Oh. And uh, there used to be one bedroom up there that didn't have a window. And my uncle uh, that lives, to, he's still alive, he's gonna turn 89 in about a week. He's just, when he wanted to get away where it was peaceful and quiet, he get into that bedroom that didn't have a window upstairs. <laughs> then later on, I mean, it was, it was a real small bedroom. It was two bedrooms made into one. So now they all have a window. And the, uh, the porch on the front, that was originally uh, all windows all the way around, and it was kind of just a three season. There was no heat in them originally. It, basically, all of them in this area later on, in later years, they closed them up and you know, they put a heating system in them, and it was basically a four season, and the room was used for something else. But uh, I can recall when, you know, it was strictly a three season sun porch. It was glass in there, and uh, but you know no heat there whatsoever in the winter months. So, and the old windows, they weren't too airtight. And that is a hunting lodge sitting right beside it. Like right next to it, like two feet over there? Or the one right this, this right, this uh, oh, reefer right oh. beside it here. Yeah. Nice. That belongs to uh, my niece's husband, uh, Domino. He's, it's got uh, Domino Ford in Park Rapids, mm -hmm. Minnesota.
So he comes out here to hunt with his buddies. So this way he doesn't have to bring anything out. That's true. I bet you you get in there right now. You can maybe even find a fifth of whiskey. You can <laughs> keep going for a while. Sure well, maybe when we come back out. <laughs> I think he's got it locked, I think. Of course, he'd, I don't know if Jim would even have a key to get in. Yeah, and that's a reefer, so that's insulated. They, 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 they're in here in the, in the fall, and they say it's, you know, it's a warm place. And that's where Grandma and Grandpa Engelhardt, their wedding dance and reception was all in the house. Yeah, that's when they used the upstairs, the main floor. Right, Grandma, I remember her telling me she said that the adults in the wedding party, they ate up on the main floor, and then the other guests had to eat in the basement. But then they had, what they had, they had like a whole, almost an orchestra. Well, but who played, you know, remember. at that time, I, I never did ask, I mean, who played for their wedding dance. And I imagine they, they mentioned it, but I never paid no attention. Because she said there was saxophones, clarinets, drums, know all that stuff and uh, they were playing in the in the dining room and then they'd have these pocket doors in the, or were they pocket door at that time or the French door the French doors the French door and then they would open it up so so I mean the whole wedding party you're dancing between the living room and the dining room that that all became and then wherever the band actually was you know it's just incredible that you had the whole thing in the house and then, you know, I remember her telling me, too, I'd always ask her questions how they had they had to feed them two meals, dinner, and then they had to feed them supper, too, and then they would dance and dance and dance, and then sometimes at midnight or later... And then the next day they day. had to come back to clean up, so, I mean, they were just usually ready to go. That's why they always had three-day weddings, <laughs> because they got together the day before to organize it, and they got, got going. Well, then there was the day of the wedding, and then the day after, well, that was the time to kind of clean up. And so, I mean, that's where the phrase come in, a three-day wedding. Well, let me ask you this last question on our, on our way back here. Why do you think it's important to share your life story? Well, I suppose it's like this. Uh, in case my grandkids... Uh, want to know something about me, they haven't asked me, uh, maybe somebody will be able to tell them, you know, part of the story, or part of the life, I mean, that I, we've had. Because, you know, I can still like, remember doing some work with the horses. Uh, I can remember my first car my dad had was a 1932 Ford. And, uh, you know, my grandkids will think that's ages. I, I don't think it's ages. 